Hello everyone, welcome back to Relax with Animal Facts. I am Steph Wolf and today I'm going to be learning with you about our furry, scaly, or possibly even slimy friends, or maybe even feathered friends, because today we are talking about the awesome penguin. So this is a special listener episode. I think almost all of these are now, from now on, going to be special listener episodes, just because I'm getting so many emails from you guys. It really puts a smile on my face that you are so passionate and, and um, you know, eager to, to learn about all these animals. Um, so it's awesome. So this uh, episode is dedicated to Jack Chamberlain from the United Kingdom. So thank you so very much, Jack, for writing in and telling me about your favorite animal, uh, which happens to be the penguin. So I really hope you enjoy uh, this episode today. So um, on the podcast, I am starting a new segment called uh, Listener Mail, where I am going to be reading some of the emails that you guys sent to me. Um, so if you want an email to be read on the podcast, or if you want to see your animal on the uh, on the podcast, you can email relaxwithanimalfacts at gmail.com, and I reply to every every uh, each and every one of you, and I've gotten so many messages from you guys, so I, I very much appreciate the support. Um, and another exciting announcement, um, those of you who have been following or subscribing on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, uh, thank you so much. We are really um, getting more and more followers every day, uh, which helps keeps the sh- uh, keep the show going. Um, and I decided we are halfway to a thousand on Spotify. When we hit a thousand followers, I'm going to be releasing one of the exclusive um, video episodes on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Just one of those episodes, um, just as a as a thank you uh, to all of those who um, who support me um, and support the show, because uh, this show I absolutely love doing, and I love um, that a lot of you enjoy it. So thank you very much. So why don't we just get right into the show? So I got my facts from GoodHousekeeping.com, National Geographic, and Live Science or Live Science. I have used this resource oh, maybe close to 30 times now, and I still don't know whether it's Live Science or Live Science, but Um, You guys know how that's spelled. Um, So I used three different resources today. The penguin has such an abundant amount of information, and I absolutely love that. Um, It's better more than less. Um, So uh, we have a lot to get through on these guys, so I'm going to be taking my time. I I noticed that I have an issue of going very, very quickly sometimes because I'll just get caught up in the the animal and sort of um, let, I'll let that passion kind of build up a, this sort of energy, I'll start talking very quickly. And uh, of course, this is a relaxed podcast. This isn't something where you have to, li- where you, um, you need to listen to me speak a mile a minute. Um, so I'm going to try to take a little bit more of my time here and try to um, sort of uh, suppress that energy just a little bit. Um, so uh, I am drinking a cam- uh, chamomile tea today. It seems to be, it seems to be my uh, go-to tea, a little bit of honey in there. For me, it's absolutely the way to go, even though it's only the mid-afternoon. Yeah, the mid-afternoon chamomile tea for me, uh, absolutely no problem. Um, so why don't we just get right into the show? So penguins are flightless seabirds that live almost exclusively below the equator. Um, almost exclusively being the, the key words there. Because there are some island dwellers uh, that can be found in some of the warmer climates. So we're not they're not only... Uh, below the equator. Um, So uh, this will include the Emperor, the Adeli, I hope I'm saying that okay, uh, Chinstrap, and Gentoo penguins. They reside in and around that uh, hallmark place of icy Antarctica. Um, But keep in mind, they are not absolutely exclusive. Um, It is really interesting that they are found in warmer climates. That is something that I did not know. I thought they were almost entirely um, exclusive. Uh, to Antarctica, but I guess I was wrong. Um, So the common name is, of course, penguins. The scientific name is uh, Svenicidae. I could start a whole segment on me mispronouncing things. (laughs) Um, Their diet, they are carnivorous animals, so they eat fish and things like that. They are not going to be eating fruits and berries and nuts because this is Antarctica for the most part uh, we're talking about here. So um, you're not going to find um, a lot of, um, if they were vegetarians, they would be in a lot of trouble. Um, so uh, the group name for a bunch of penguins together is known as a colony, um, and they can live 
uh, up to 20 years, 15 to 20 years. I didn't find any statistics related to penguins in captivity, for example, in zoos and things like that. Um, but as, as we've seen on multiple times on the show, um, usually their life expectancy will increase in captivity just because, you know, um, things like infections are treatable, stuff like that, um, rather than being uh, totally on their own. So their size will range from 16 to 45 inches. So they have a very big uh, kind of discrepancy there um, just because there are a lot of different species of penguin. Um, in fact, 18 different species. Um, and they will also range from two pounds, two pounds to 88 pounds. The two pounds uh, that is very cute and most likely uh, are attributed to the fairy penguins or little penguins. Um, so the 18 different species of penguins, they can widely, uh, uh, they can widely sort of uh, differ in shape and size, um, but uh, they will all have that, that signature sort of black body, white belly. Um, and this is not for no reason. Um, this actually allows them to hide from predators um, just because uh, they have this sort of counter shading, as it's called. It is referred to on National Geographic as a protective counter shading. It allows them to hide from predators such as uh, the signature leopard seals that hunt them a lot um, and orcas as well. Um, so while they swim, just because from underneath the white belly can blend a little bit into the uh, sky. Um, so it can help them sort of uh, blend in there. So they're, you know, um, if they were, I suppose, green or all black, it would be a little bit easier for them to be seen. Um, and the smaller species, as we just said, is the little blue penguin, um, or also called the fairy penguin or the little penguin for short. So they, um, they span from around 13 to 15 inches, which is so very cute. Um, and they would look absolutely tiny next to the emperor penguins, which are kind of the big boys in the penguin um, kind of kingdom there. So the, the emperor penguins are gonna be close to four feet tall. So if you compare that to um, 13 inch, um, you know, a 13 inch penguin, they're gonna look very, very different. Um, and uh, so these, these, little, uh, these little cuties can weigh no more um, than three pounds, which is incredible three pound little penguins. Very well known fact is that penguins cannot fly. So they are part of the uh, flightless bird sort of um, category there. Um, they have stiff flippers, webbed feet, and they have a sleek shape that uh, doesn't suit them for flying, but rather makes them absolutely expert swimmers. Um, and in fact, they will spend most of their lives in the ocean and do nearly all of their hunting, specifically uh, crabs, krill, squid, which is uh, why they're carnivorous, of course. Um, and if you're if you're wondering how fast they can swim, uh, they can swim up to 15 miles an hour. So um, they can go even um, they can go even faster by leaping out of the water as they swim to kind of um, you know you've seen this in dolphins and stuff maybe how they do that sort of majestic um, breach of the water uh, before going back down again. Penguins can do the same thing to, to increase their speeds um, even more. So it, it's clear that they do not need, um, they, don't, they, uh, they don't have to be physics majors to figure out how to go as fast as, um, I was going to say humanly possible, but I suppose um, more suitable is penguinly possible. When they leap out of the water, they will release air bubbles from the feathers, which will uh, ultimately allow them to cut down on drag and also, um, so in turn, doubling or even tripling their speed underwater. This is according to uh, the Smithsonian, um, which is another very reputable source. Um, and to leap back ashore, some of the smaller penguins can launch themselves six or even nine feet into the air by uh, really, um, you know, putting it into 10th gear there sw and uh, swimming to the surface to be able to uh, burst up over the ice shelf. So uh, very cool that they have this understanding of, uh, maybe not understanding of physics is the wrong word, but this innate um, sort of uh, capacity to understand what to make them uh, go as fast as possible. Because I'm sure their predators, orcas and leopard seals, um, can uh, really go fast as well, even though they're, they're much larger in size. And they can dive over 800 feet. 
So the deepest dive ever recorded by the Australian Antarctic Division, um, an emperor penguin, if we remember the four foot tall, kind of very large penguin, it reached an amazing 1,850 feet. So um, that is without, I guess, any equipment or anything, um, 1,850 feet is very, very deep. That is, um, the pressure increases a great amount um, the, the, the lower you go, and especially 1,800 feet. Um, I mean, for me, for God's sakes, I sometimes have trouble getting to the bottom of the swimming pool without having my ears hurt or, or whatever. So um, I, I don't have anything on the Emperor Penguin. Um, so this not only, um, they're not only suited uh, to this by having kind of the advantages of um, being able to withstand greater pressures, um, they also have a greater lung capacity. So the longest known dives that were recorded have lasted about 22 minutes. So um, penguins definitely score high on our list of um, animals that can hold their breath. It seems like I should do a recap maybe by next season of uh, who's top dog when it comes to holding their breath. So they can drink seawater, um, which is something that us humans can't do obviously because of the salinity. Um, so while penguins sip meltwater mostly um, from pools and streams, when they're thirsty, their hunting style and diet um, necessitates a cool adaptation. So they have a super orbital gland, which is a gland that I think we have covered before on the podcast with a different animal. I just can't remember which one specifically. Um, but uh, this gland allows them to remove salt from their bloodstream so um, the excess sodium will then come out through the bill um, that they have um, or by sneezing so that is so cool that they have this uh, ad adaptation to be able to drink seawater if necessary it's something that i think um, i think i would love to have a super orbital gland if the whole world had a super orbital gland i i, I suppose um, this whole thing of fresh water and salt water wouldn't be as important um, so, uh, talking about a little bit of, about an extinct species of penguins. Um, so there were some extinct ones that grew more than five feet tall. So huge, huge penguins. Um, they were recently discovered, these fossils that indicate an ancient breed of penguins that once stood taller than the average adult man today at five foot 10. So about 60 million years ago, so pretty much outliving the dinosaurs there, um, it was known, oh, here we go again with the butchering of the name, um, Kumimanu uh, Bise. It weighed about 220 pounds, so an over 200 pound penguin, um, and another extinct genus uh, known as the uh, Pahidiptes. <laughs> um, also probably reached about four feet. So um, I think extinct ancient penguins are definitely something that... Um, will be covered on the Patreon sooner or later. Um, so that's very cool. Um, and penguins don't actually have teeth. Um, they have these little sp uh, fleshy spines that are inside their mouth that will allow them to swallow fish uh, with greater ease. So um, they have these protrusions that face backward in order to help guide uh, the catch all the way down their throats um, into their stomach. So uh, very cool. I guess they don't need teeth. They don't need dentists. So they can cut back a little bit on, on some, on some uh, dentist cleanings and things like that. Um, and they, they can just uh, keep with their fleshy spines in the mouth. Um, at first I thought I read that wrong because a fleshy spine inside the mouth didn't seem right. But that is indeed right. Um, so they go through a what is referred to as a catastrophic molt about once a year. So basically what happens during this process, I'm sure that um, a lot of you have heard the word molt before. So the penguins will lose all of their feathers during the two to three work process, uh, sorry, two to three week process, um, and they can't swim or fish until this important insulation comes back. So this, I assume, is important to uh, keep them uh, healthy and at the peak of their hunting and swimming gain. Um, so insulation, especially if you're talking about in the Antarctic, um, is super, super important. For example, the polar bear, which we covered on the podcast, have, have 
has um, a tremendous amount of insulation happening through fat and through its fur. Um, so without this insulation, the penguins would ha would be in big trouble when they're swimming in the water. Maybe not only for um, for uh, warmth purposes, but also I assume it would affect their hydrodynamics a little bit. Um, so um, penguin species do something that's pretty common among birds in general. It's that they mate for life. So it's very cute um, how this mating thing uh, happens with them. Um, so they're monogamous, uh, absolutely monogamous. And um, when I say absolutely, I can't say that maybe just because um, I'm sure that it has happened before where a penguin has cheated on another penguin. Um, so maybe I can't say uh, absolutely, but um, for the most part, they meet for life. And there's some very, very nice documentaries um, that cover most of this kind of mating process with penguins because it's super interesting. So I, I definitely recommend um, some of you go watch that. Um, so uh, couples locate each other with very distinct calls. They each have their own unique sounds that will help them reunite on the breeding ground. Um, and this is super, super important just because the birds, they look almost identical. And there are thousands of birds, thousands of them. Um, if you've seen pictures of the colonies, there are so, so many birds. Um, and it's amazing, uh, it's amazing that they're able to interpret um, their mate's call out of the bunch. Um, it'll also, as we see just um, in a second, that the um, offspring also uh, have a, a sort of um, characteristic call, I guess you could say, that the parent can respond to um, out of, you know, thousands of little identical babies um, kind of uh, sitting or, or running around, I suppose. Um, and for breeding, the female will lay only one to two eggs at a time. So it is a very big job um, for parents to keep um, kind of the, the eggs warm and to be able to feed them. Um, so when they hatch, th that feeding and the protection is going to come in. And if they were to have more than one or two eggs, it would be a big, big problem. Um, probably, I would assume. So for a few weeks each year, thousands of baby birds will wait together while their parents forage for food. Um, when mother and father return, they will, um, the chicks will listen for the unique um, sort of audio frequency of their parents' calls, which will allow them to reunite in a very large and noisy crowd. Now, I've watched a documentary before of penguins, um, and some penguins like to kind of, um, parenting is almost like shift work. Um, so say the, um, so the mother would sit on the eggs for however long it would take for this um, father to go and to hunt. Um, and when the father would return, maybe, um, I'm not sure exactly how long, um, I think it's, um, you know, every day they go and they return and they do sort of shift work like that. So then the father will go and incubate the eggs while the, um, while the mother will go and hunt again. Um, for some species, this sort of shift work is integral to survival just because they have to run, uh, or they have to waddle a very far, um, sometimes their colonies will be kind of a little bit farther from the water. So um, it'll be very taxing if it was the same penguin going and hunting every time, you know, walking from the colony, jumping into the water, um, you know, fishing for however long, jumping back in the water, walking all the way back to the colony. Um, so having shift work would really helps with the, with the workload, I suppose, of, of hunting and, and things like that. Um, so the best mates for penguins are going to be the pudgier penguins. This is because um, the of what we just talked about, the intense fasting that is involved. Um, so females will often seek out uh, chubbier uh, male penguins who will be able to go uh, for weeks without food. Um, so... Um, as the ladies will take a turn to hunt for fish. So um, as we just talked about, and um, that makes absolute sense, having a chubbier male allows for definitely a higher chance of survival. Um, and these guys are actually waterproof. So um, they spread an oil that is produced by what is called the preen gland. That's P-R-E-E-N. Um, so this preen gland will insulate their bodies totally um, and in the end sort of improve their hydrodynamics, um, which is really, really cool. Um, so if they're waterproof, that means that this oil would make their feathers hydrophobic. I don't know um, if it's if it's the outside, if it's the inside exactly. 
Um, so uh, maybe that would be worth digging into just a little bit farther. Um, and penguins are total social butterflies. Um, so the largest colonies, um, which are called rookeries or wattles, um, I love that word, wattles, um, because that's exactly what these waddling guys do. Um, when they're assembled on land, there can be hundreds of thousands of birds. So, yeah, having that, the, uh, the ability to distinct from one another by using distinct calls is absolutely crucial to um, not only survival, but I guess the, um, the uh, advancement of their own genes, I suppose you could say. Um, so, a group of penguins in the water, so this is very similar to the otter, well, it is the same as the otter. So if you guys have listened to the otter podcast, a group of penguins in the in the water is going to be called a raft. So um, they will spend up to 80% of their lives out at sea. So um, I suppose maybe coming together could help for warmth. I'm not so sure in the water, though, um, or why they would even come together in the water. Um, so that's also maybe worth looking into. And if there's anything that um, I say on the podcast um, that you find really interesting, I always encourage you guys to go research for yourself as well some of these things. Um, you know, it's good to be skeptical. It's good to research yourself sometimes. Um, so if that if you do come into that uh, kind of thing, um, then um, I absolutely encourage it. Um, so penguins are especially adapted to be able to sink so uh, many birds um, float on the top of the water um, and this is because they have hollow bones to be able to uh, fly because when you have less of a load to carry flight becomes a lot easier so if um, most birds had the very dense skeletons that penguins have flying would be an incredibly difficult task and most likely impossible um, I, I suppose depending on wingspan wing size things like that um, but these penguins have dense skeletons um, to allow for much easier diving, um, which is a very good adaptation to have, seeing as they spend um, more than uh, you know um, more than eighty percent of their life uh, in the water. So um, this is common knowledge, I suppose, but they are very friendly with people generally. Um, so the penguins' main predators are like sea lions, seals sharks and whales which all reside in the water um, which would make sense why we, they wouldn't be threatened so much as humans because we uh, mostly approach them um, on land so they feel much safer on land around researchers and tourists and whatnot um, this could be for better or for worse because i suppose it depends on the um, on the people their intention because as we learned on the patreon episode the dodo bird was very trusting of, I suppose, well, not so much tourists, but settlers, and that didn't work out so, so well. Um, but, um, you know, penguins um, are very trusting, um, on land at least. Maybe if we swam up to them in the water, they would be a little bit more cautious um, if you want to be swimming in, in the uh, Antarctic. That is your choice. Um, penguins huddle for warmth. So, um, again, another key feature of penguins, something that has been um, kind of referred to a lot in history and culture and movies, stuff like that. Um, so the emperor penguins have perfected their group hugs to a science, as it is written here. Some birds um, in the middle will actually get too hot um, in negative degree temperatures, if you can believe that. And they will have the need to waddle their way out, kind of escape a little bit, um, then to... Uh, uh, to, to get to a little bit cooler place and then they will switch out to the middle whoever is i suppose maybe on the outside can go in the middle to get a little bit more warmth um, so that's very cool um, and just like me these penguins love to to uh, toboggan so instead of shuffling across the ice if they have the opportunity to say it at, you know uh, the ice goes downhill a little bit um, many penguins love to lay on their stomachs and just propel themselves with their feet. So it's definitely a faster way for them to get around than to do that sort of walking, um, that weird waddle that they do, uh, or the cute waddle, I suppose. Um, and it's just plain fun for them. Um, and if you wonder why they waddle, they, um, so 
for, uh, first thing, uh, maybe a myth, uh, myth busting kind of here. Um, penguins do indeed have knees. They are just very, very high up in their body, um, just because I suppose there's no need for them to be any lower because they, um, they are mostly adapted to be in the water. Um, but this is what creates that kind of weird waddle. Um, it is because of the an uh, anatomy of their legs. So they do have knees. They're just pushed really high up, um, uh, in, I guess, in relation to us humans. Um, so penguin chicks will start out as just little fluff balls. Uh, their first coat of feathers will consist of, of a very light down. Um, and the, the weatherproof layer that allows for much of the insulation will grow in later. So it'll still be needed to, I suppose, huddle and things like that. Um, but they look quite cute. They have this sort of grayish kind of very fluffy uh, tint to them. It's, it's very, very cute. Um, and about two-thirds of the penguin species uh, currently is listed as threatened on the IUCN red list, which makes them one of the most endangered seabirds. So unfortunately, of course, these birds are absolutely uh, beautiful, um, but this, this is due to loss of habitat, disease, and um, even some infection, uh, infectious diseases that are spread by tourists um, is, is, is something that they need to watch out for. Um, also things like uh, commercial fishing being a problem. Um, I think that uh, they have possibly cut down on commercial fishing um, that could um, affect the penguins' habitat. Um, I, at least, at least um, I gotta say I hope so. Um, and the last thing that affects them is climate change. Climate change is obviously going to affect them because they are really at, um, I guess, the um, the pivotal area at which climate change affects. So, you know, loss of habitat by climate change, um, just because glaciers are melting, things like that. Um, but of course, I don't need to educate most of you on climate change, just because it has been really, um, uh, you know, advertised a lot and uh, mostly understood. So, uh, which is a good thing. Um, so the last fact of the show is going to be the name. Where did the name come from? So the now extinct giant auk, which is spelled A-U-K, maybe it's pronounced oak, I'm not exactly sure, um, but um, it looks, it looked like the funny black and white creatures, so uh, the giant auk. So the, the explorers encountered uh, them in the southern hemisphere, and so they ended up using the scientific name uh, Penguinus in in penis as uh, as sort of an inspiration. So um, looking at the, the the currently extinct giant auk, they were able to find some inspiration for the name of the penguin. So um, very, very cool. Again, thank you so much, Jack, for that recommendation. There were so many different facts to choose from. I had to bring them down a little bit. I'm sure I could have gone for another half an hour on these guys. So very, very awesome. Uh, so thank you for writing in. Um, and we're gonna do a listener mail. So listener mail is going to be coming from Diego Perea, um, and he wrote, Hey Stefan, I love the podcast. I started listening recently while going to sleep, and it has now become part of my nightly routine. I just wanted to show my appreciation for it and encourage you to continue it. Also, if you would like any animal suggestions, then here are some that I think uh, are interesting and would like to learn more about. Um, Slow loris, mantis shrimp, Cape Buffalo, Spider Monkey, whenever I see a monkey, I'm on board, uh, and Wombat, uh, an Australian, I suppose, favorite. Um, and then uh, it just says, Best Diego. Um, so Diego, thank you so much for writing into the show, um, and very, very good suggestions. Um, I, I, uh, I've gotten many emails from a lot of you uh, that um, say that this podcast has become part of your nightly routine. And that is uh, such a, uh, a fantastic thing for me to hear. Um, I, I love that you guys are able to listen to this show to fall asleep to and things like that, and that it could help some of you get to sleep. Um, that is mostly the reason why I do this podcast, other than also just loving animals. Um, so if you would like to have um, your uh, mail read on the podcast, or if you want to hear your animal on the show, go ahead and send an email to relaxwithanimalfacts at gmail.com. And I will um, reply to you. I've replied to every single person that's written in. Um, so thank you all for joining me for this um, very fun episode of The Penguin. And I will see you on the next podcast episode with the next animal. Take care.